place to hide this weary soul This bag of bones And I try with all my might I just can't win a fight I'm slowly drifting A bag of bones And just when to hide I was a blind man wandering until I saw the light Oh, I've got a story I can't deny Oh, I'm a living, breathing miracle and I just gotta testify
can love me like Jesus because I'll tell you what church one of my favorite verses in scripture is when the Lord says I'm the Lord your God nothing is impossible for me no matter how far you feel like you've wandered from the Lord no matter how much shame or hurt you carry no matter where you've been or where you're going his love is sufficient for you he is more than able to meet our needs, to give us exactly what we need. He knows it better than we know it ourselves. And that's a reason to give him praise, amen? So when things seem hard, when we get together and worship, we remind ourselves of God's goodness and that he is more than able. So let's sing, come on.
of what the Lord can do in your life today? No, He wants to do something new in your life, in your family today, this morning. Something new is breaking through. Take a moment, say hi to your neighbor, hi to a friend. Give them a handshake or a wave. Let them know you're glad they're here because they're a child of God. It's so good to see you up in the balcony. I love seeing you guys online. Thank you for joining us, our volunteers and guests. You are so valued. I'm so glad you're here. Wow. Well, it's not a mistake that you're here today. Today is a day of life change. It's a summer of life change at Woodlands Church. There is so much going on, so much happening. One of the coolest things going on right now is we have Pastor Lee Strobel with us this morning. Pastor Lee is a best-selling author. He's an amazing, yeah, he's an amazing speaker. You are going to get an amazing message from Lee. I've gotten to hear it last night and it is so, so powerful. God's gonna give you a little bit of insight into how he sees things and what he wants to do in your life. But the reason he's with us today is because Pastor Kerry and Chris are actually traveling right now in Brazil. They're actually teaching over 2,000 pastors in South America how we do ministry here at Woodlands Church. Take a look. The only way he asks us to fulfill the vision, a única forma que ele nos pede para alcançar a visão, is to build people one step at a time, one person at a time. É de edificar a vida de pessoas, uma pessoa por vez, um passo por vez. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. We're excited about it. And the reason that's going on is because of the ministry that you do as leaders, as volunteers. We're really taking that model and we're sharing it with pastors, churches all around the world. So it's so cool to see the way that the Woodlands Church ministry model is being taken around the world, adapted, and really being used to build the kingdom of Christ. We're so thankful that you're here today. There's a few announcements I wanna let you know about. We actually just had our high school students come back from high school camp uh, this past week. And man, the difference, it's, yeah, the difference that we've seen in some of these high school students has been incredible. I know many of your children were able to go, many of your students, and we had so many baptized. Mark, Mark how many do we have baptized? Over, we had over 260 baptized at student camp. It's amazing, yeah, incredible. The difference that God is making in this next generation through you, through our student ministry, is amazing. We also have vacation Bible schools coming up. We have VBS, which is for our K through fifth grade. If you'd like to check that out, we have, it's a day camp. Um, it's super simple to sign up for. Go to wc.org forward slash VBS. We also have our junior high camp coming up right around the corner. Children's camps coming up right around the corner. A lot of summer camps, a lot of summer ministry is happening. So I wanna encourage you to get your kids signed up now if you haven't already. We also have the biggest holiday of the weekend coming up next weekend. The biggest holiday of the year coming up next weekend. And uh, you know, it's, yeah, Father's Day. I guess it's not a big deal to anybody. It's a big deal to us, yeah. It's a big deal to me now that I'm a dad. We are excited about Father's Day because Father's Day is a chance for us to honor our dads and to celebrate as a family. We're gonna make some great memories out there on the plaza. We're gonna have games, food, prizes. Just a great time to invite your friends, invite your uh, community, your neighbors. It's a great chance to invite your neighbors out to church. So I encourage you to do that. And we're also just really excited because we have Super Summer Baptism this weekend. You're here for it. It's not a mistake that you're here. God had a plan for you to be here this weekend. We're so glad that you're with us. And we're gonna continue to hear a great message from Pastor Lee Strobel, and God has a great word for you. I'm excited for you to hear it. You're gonna get so much out of this message. It's gonna be incredible. But right now, I wanna encourage you to go ahead and stand and worship with us as we worship Jesus as a church family. Let's do this. Turn it in your face. 
watching work it for your good watching work it for your good he's not done cause he's not done with what he started not yet but he's not done until it's good so hello peace hello joy hello Welcome him in. Hello, hope is a new horizon. Sing hello, hello, peace, hello, joy, hello, love, and hello, strength. what struggles you were facing yesterday. Today is a new day. There's breath in our lungs. We can praise the Lord and know that fear is not our future. Sing, fear is not my future. You are. Come on, declare who he is. This sickness is not my story. You are. Come on. Heartbreak's not my home, but you are. Jesus, you are. You're everything we need. Death is not the end, but you are, yes you are. Sing fear, fear is not my fear. I won't let it detain my future. But you are Jesus, sickness is not my story. No, it won't define me. You are. Heartbreak's not my home, but you are, yes you are. Yes you are. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful that when we are in you, we have no need to fear. That you love us, that you redeem us, that you care for us, that you created us, that we can be in relationship with you. Thank you that in you there is hope, there's future, there's security, there's courage, there's love. We thank you for all that. And we pray on this special weekend that as your message goes out from your word, that lives will be touched and changed for eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. Great to be with you. I, uh, I was looking at my bookshelf the other day, and I came across a book. I thought, oh, I haven't seen this book in years. 
and I pulled it down. It was published a number of years ago. It was written by a guy by the name of Douglas Coupland. He's a Canadian author, and he's known as a particularly incisive analyst of popular culture in North America. And I thought, this is a book written a number of years ago, but it is hauntingly relevant today. The book is called Life After God. And in this book, Douglas tracks a young man through a troubled era of his life. He's remorseful over his mistakes. His marriage has stagnated. He's ensnared in a meaningless job. Instead of deep friendships, he has what he calls halfway relationships. He's worried that he just doesn't feel life the way he used to. But after 358 pages of aimlessness and frustration, this was his conclusion. He said, now here is my secret. I tell it to you with an openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. So I pray that you are in a quiet room as you read these words. My secret is that I need God, that I am sick and could no longer make it alone. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem capable of giving, to help me be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness, to bring me love as I seem beyond being able to love. Well, maybe you have a secret too. I mean, maybe you need God in your life to breathe uh, fresh hope and, and, and um, a, a new perspective into your world. Or maybe you need God to knock the crust off a heart that's corroded by ambition and self-interest and cynicism. Or maybe you just sense there's got to be more to life than a job and three meals a day and, and this gnawing feeling that something's missing, something is missing. Well, guess what? If you have any of those kind of feelings, you've come to the right place this weekend. Because as Ryan said, this is a weekend of life change here at Woodlands Church. And that's illustrated by the fact that after the services today, and we had it last night, we have it at our Tascacita campus, 548 of your neighbors who've come to faith in Jesus Christ are going to be baptized. Five, isn't that awesome? And I, I wish every one of them could come up here for just a few minutes and, and tell you their story of how they found God, how they found hope, how they find redemption. Um, but obviously we don't have time for that. I just want to give an opportunity to you to hear one story uh, from a woman by the name of Kayla. She was baptized at our last super baptism um, weekend last year. But I think she represents the kind of story that so many others would love to share if they could. So listen to Kayla's story. We moved to Texas with the hopes of being able to raise a family. Um, we were already married. We bought a house um, in the area. My sister had shown me the Woodlands Church. She used to just bring my niece here to play. She showed me the fountain and she said, oh, it's just this really pretty place. Since then, I found myself just coming to sit by the fountain and just enjoy the peace that it brought me. All the decisions I had made in my life, those were all things that I had, decisions I had made in hopes of becoming a mom one day. Um, but unfortunately, we did run into some um, fertility issues. I had put a lot of my self-worth in being a mom, and when I realized that might not happen for me, um, it was heartbreaking. During that time, when I was going through fertility treatment, I would go to my treatments, and then I would come and drive over to the church and talk to God. I always believed that there was a God, um, but I was very confused as far as where Christ came in. I, I never figured out how to piece that together. I had a moment where I was talking to God and I said, you know, all of these decisions I've made up until now have been on being a mother. Um, and if that's not your plan for me, um, pretty much I surrendered my life to whatever his plan was for me. 
A couple of weeks after I had sat by the fountain and had that conversation with God, I actually found out that I was pregnant. Um, and then at my next appointment, after I had been told that I was pregnant, I had my first ultrasound and I found out that I was pregnant with twins. I knew that God was more than I had ever known him to be and I wanted to know more. Um, so after that, I had started to um, watch the services online. Um, I started to kind of understand, okay, this is where Christ fits into this picture. Um, Pastor Kerry said that he was going to start doing a daily devotional going through the book of John, which I had never read. Um, and I did that, and since I read that, I have not stopped. I realized who Christ was. I realized it through a lot of the people that had come into my life and shown me that, through the way that they treated me, through the way that they guided me. Um, and then as I got to reading, opening up the Bible and reading it for myself, I had sent an email to someone at the Woodland Church and I was like, I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized in this fountain. How can I make it happen? Um, and they were quick to let me know that um, Super Summer Baptism was happening and it sounded great. Baptism is your way of publicly displaying that you're a follower of Christ, you believe what he's done for you, and you want to show the world and you're not afraid to show that. Um, and I knew I wanted to do that. It just was like a full circle moment for me. Um, my boys were there, my husband was there. The first time I'd come to that fountain, I knew of a God. And then that day when I was baptized, I knew him. I was sure that he wanted what was good for my life. And I was ready to show the world that that was how I felt and that's what I believe. It was definitely a full circle moment for me. A great story. So Kara and the others being baptized this weekend share something. This is a public proclamation of a private transaction that happened between them and God when they receive God's free gift of forgiveness and eternal life and were baptized into God's family and God flung open the doors of heaven for them for someday as they will spend eternity with him forever. But guess what? That's not all that is happening to them. You see, their salvation occurred in an instant, in a blink of an eye. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So they believe that Jesus is the Son of God, who proved it by returning from the dead. They received him as their forgiver and leader in a prayer of repentance and faith, and they thus became a child of God forever. But that's just the start. You see, now they begin to undergo a process that theologians call sanctification, which will continue the rest of their life. You see, they brought nothing to the table when they received the salvation. It's a free gift of God's grace. But when they entered into God's kingdom, when they received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, something supernatural, many things supernatural began to happen. One of them is the Holy Spirit took up residence inside of them. And now, the rest of their lives, they'll be able to cooperate and work with the Holy Spirit so that over time, they will become more and more like Jesus. Listen to what Jesus told his disciples in John 14, verses 16 and 17. He said, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So over time, the Holy Spirit will transform their attitudes and their worldview and their morality and their character and their relationships over the rest of their life. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23 says this, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, fruit is the word that the Apostle Paul uses to describe the natural outcome of cooperating with the Holy Spirit as he transforms our life. How do we cooperate with him? Through a life of prayer, through a life of studying the Word of God and applying it to our lives, through a, a life of spiritual growth. Not that we ever achieve perfection in these nine areas, but we make increasing progress over time in these nine areas. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You see, in the original Greek, the word fruit is singular, which means these nine qualities are a package deal. But I want to walk through each one of them individually because I really believe these are the exact nine things that we all are looking for in our lives. The first one is love. First one is love. You know, the Surgeon General of the United States said recently that we have an epidemic in our country of loneliness and isolation and a lack of connection. I mean, even before the pandemic hit, half of American adults reported they had measurable levels of loneliness. And by the way, a lack of connection is as dangerous to our physical health as cigarette smoking is. In short, we need love. And 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8 says, love comes from God because God is love. So people long for God to increase our capacity to give and receive love. The second quality that Paul mentions in Galatians is joy, that he will manifest more and more joy in our lives. When, the la when is the last time you felt lighthearted in life, exuberant in life? I mean, we live in a world where there's heartbreak and there's inevitable hardships that take place. Don't we just want some joy in our lives? I'm not talking just about happiness, because happiness is dependent on happenings in our life. You know, if, if things are going great in our life, we feel happy, we feel joyful. If they're not, we don't. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a confident joy from the Lord that continues even during the tough times of our lives. John 16, verse 24 says, ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. Third quality that Paul mentions in Galatians is the quality of peace, of peace. You know, our culture is saturated with anxiety. One out of five American adults suffers from some sort of anxiety disorder. We can't sleep at night. Why? Because we're pestered with all these anxious thoughts. The pastor, Tony Evans, recently sent out a tweet talking about worry. And he said, we've got the pain of the past to worry about, the problems of the present, and the unexpected of the future, and it just keeps on coming. But John 14, verse 27, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You see, the peace of God is like a cup of cold water to a parched soul. And then fourth quality is patience, is patience. How often do we lose our temper in life? When we're in a traffic jam, when we see something on the news or the internet that upsets us, we lose our temper. Um, we want to give up on things a lot more quickly than we ought to. There's this anger that often bubbles beneath the surface of our lives. I mean, we need God's help to live out Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9, which says, control your temper, for God labels you, for anger labels you as a fool. Fifth, there's kindness, kindness. I mean, it's so easy these days in this world to develop a calloused heart. We see other people so many times as obstacles, as distractions to us, instead of as persons who are made in the image of God. I mean, wouldn't we all be happier if we just were able to show and receive more kindness in our world? I mean, God has shown us kindness. Acts 14, verse 17 says, God has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fulfills and fills your heart with joy. Next quality is goodness, goodness. Even though we know what's right many times, why do we choose what's wrong? 
I mean, we, we know the right thing to do. Why so often do we choose the wrong thing? Why do we take ethical shortcuts? And why do we pursue things that are only going to hurt us in the end? How many times do we know this is the good path to take, eh, but I think I'm going to go this way? I mean, we need God's help. So we will confidently head in the right direction of goodness. Paul prayed for the Christians in Thessalonica that by God's power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness. And seventh quality is faithfulness, faithfulness. You know, it seems these days like commitment has gone out the window in so many cases. We often choose expediency over devotion. Our relationships can turn into shifting sand. I mean, wouldn't it be a better world if our word was our bond? Proverbs 3, verse 3 says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. The eighth quality is gentleness. Gentleness. Yeah, we live in an exploitive world. We live in a harsh world. I, I, I'm sure you're on social media. I find the social media so many times, it's like a blood sport where there's so many personal attacks and ugly rhetoric and division that takes place. So many times we tend to think the worst of each other instead of the best of each other. We want to win in life, but sometimes we kind of celebrate the fact that other people are losing. Philippians 4 verse 5 says to Christians, let your gentleness be evident to all. And then final quality is self-control self-control. How many times do we give in to temptation? How many times do we fall into self-destructive behavior that we just can't seem to conquer in our life? Why do we let our impulses rule our decisions? I mean, we need God to liberate us from harming ourselves and to free us from the addictions and the bad habits that we've developed. How important is self-control? Proverbs 16, verse 32 says, it's actually better to be a person with self-control than to be a warrior. Specifically, it says, it's better to be one with self-control than one who takes a city. I mean, what an incredible offer this is by God. Not only in an instant will I redeem you, invite you, adopt you into my kingdom forever, but over time, these nine qualities, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these nine things that all of us hunger for. As we cooperate with the Holy Spirit who's now in our lives, I will manifest those things more and more in your world. And sometimes we wonder, can that really happen? Can that happen to me? Can it happen to you? I mean, maybe you're too far gone. Maybe you feel like, yeah, 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 you know, you don't know my story. You don't know my life. You don't know the things I've been involved in. You don't know how far I have been from those nine qualities. And we think maybe we're exempt. <laughs> maybe we're the exception. God can't do that in someone like me. And when somebody says something like that to me, you know what I do? I pull them aside and I tell them the true story about a guy by the name of Billy Moore. Billy Moore grew up in rural Georgia. He was a troubled kid, got involved with petty crimes as he was growing up, you know, stealing things from garages, things like that. He joined the army thinking maybe that would straighten his life out, but it really didn't do that. And so one day he and a friend were drinking whiskey in Billy's trailer there in rural Georgia. And Billy was complaining. He didn't have enough money to pay the rent on the trailer for the next month. And his friend said, yeah, but, you know, that's not really a problem. And Billy said, what do you mean? He said, I know a guy. He's, a, he's an old grandfather, and he lives in another trailer in another area. And he doesn't believe in banks. He keeps his money under his bed. And Billy said, really? So Billy got drunk, and he got a gun, and he loaded it, and he went to rob that elderly grandfather. And when the grandfather tried defending himself, Billy Moore shot the gun into the darkness and killed that elderly man. And then he stole $5,600 from under the man's bed and fled. Well, it didn't take long for the police to figure out it was Billy Moore that committed this crime. And they came to Billy's trailer later and they arrested him. 
and they charged him with capital murder. And so that first night, Billy sat alone in his cell, realizing for the first time he had no future, he had no hope. All he had left in his life was a date with the electric chair down the corridor. But shortly after his arrest, a local church saw an item in the newspaper about the fact this army uh, private had been arrested for murder, and they sent a couple from the church to the jail to speak with Billy Moore. And they sat down with Billy and said, Billy, you need to know something. God is willing to give you a fresh start and to change your life, give you a second chance at living. And Billy looked at them dumbfounded, and he said, in effect, you don't understand. I went into someone's house and murdered them during a burglary. I'm all out of fresh starts. My life is over. There's an electric chair down the hall that's just waiting for me, and I'm going to die in it before too long. So it's too late for me to get a fresh start. But that couple shook their head and said, Billy, it's never too late. God loves you. Jesus died for you. He paid the penalty you deserve for your sins. He offers forgiveness and eternal life as a free gift of his grace. And you know what? If you receive that free gift, God will change your life and he will make your life count. And Billy not only heard the words from this young couple, he saw Jesus in the countenance of their faces. And he said later, nobody ever told me that Jesus loves me and died for me. It was a love I could feel. It was a love I wanted. It was a love that I needed. And so Billy Moore, as hopeless of an individual as you will ever meet, said yes to this radical offer of God's grace. And he was baptized in a rusty old bathtub right there in the jail. And sure enough, Billy's life began to change as the Holy Spirit took up residence in Billy Moore and began to transform him. He went into court, and he said, you know, I'm a Christian now, and I got to tell you the truth. I did it. I'm sorry I did it. I wish I hadn't done it, but the truth is, I killed him, and I'm sorry. And the judge found him guilty of capital murder and sentenced him to death in the electric chair. Well, you know, it took, it, it takes a long time in our legal system for things to kind of churn through. And so it took 16 years for the courts to catch up with the execution date of Billy Moore. And so here he is for 16 and a half years, he's sitting on death row. But as he over time cooperated through a life of prayer, through a life of Bible study, cooperated with the Holy Spirit in his life and opened himself more and more to God, God began to make him into a new person. In fact, he became a model prisoner on death row. The guards had a nickname for him. They called him the peacemaker because it was Billy who brought calm and peace to a place that used to be filled with despair and hate and violence. In fact, Billy led so many Bible studies among the inmates. He helped so many of the inmates and the guards find hope and redemption through Jesus Christ. The entire environment of death row was transformed for the good. Billy, over the years, took 32 correspondence courses from a Bible college. He became such an effective counselor that local churches in the community would send troubled teenagers to death row to be counseled by this man who lived in a cage. Friends, the question has never been, will God forgive you of your sins? It's not the issue. The Bible says in 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, it's not the issue of whether he will forgive us. The issue is, will you confess your sins? Will you ask God to forgive you for the wrongdoing in your life? Because friends, if he can forgive a killer like Billy Moore, what sin could you possibly have committed that is worse than that. And friends, the question is not, will God transform your life? The question is not, will God make your life count? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. He's not the same anymore. A new life has begun. No, 
The question is, will you open your life to the Holy Spirit's power to change you for the good over time and give you a purpose for life that goes beyond merely eating and sleeping and going to work? I mean, if God can use a man in a cage like Billy Moore to make an eternal impact on so many other inmates and guards and change the entire environment of death row, how might God use your life in your family, in your neighborhood, in this church, or in this community? Well, as I say, it took time for the courts to churn through their procedures, took 16 years, and then came the time for Billy to die. The death sentence had been affirmed all the way to the Supreme Court and back several times, and the hours were ticking down to August the 22nd, when Billy would be strapped into the electric chair and 26,000 volts of electricity would course through his body and kill him. And so here Billy is sitting in the death watch cell, which is right next to the electric chair where they put you before they kill you, and they'd shaved his head for the electrodes to be attached. And his lawyers would call him to try to console him um, in these moments before he was to die. And I got a chance to talk to those lawyers. And I said, what was that like to call Billy Moore right before he was going to die? And one of them said to me, he said, Lee, it was the strangest thing. We'd call with the intention of consoling Billy, but with Billy who would console us. Billy would say things like, are you guys okay? He'd say, are you guys going to get through this all right? Are you coping with this? I mean, they told me with astonishment, although Billy Moore was the one facing an imminent death, he was concerned about how they were doing. Why? Because Billy Moore was ready to die. He was ready. Why? Because Jesus had forgiven him. He had forgiven his guilt. He had released his guilt. He had adopted him as his son. And Billy Moore knew if God loved him that much, he could trust what God will do with him after he dies. Well, it was just seven and a half hours before Billy was to be executed, and something amazing happened, something unprecedented happened, something so incredible that it made next day the front page of the New York Times. The Georgia Pardon and Parole Board held an emergency hearing about a model prisoner by the name of Billy Moore because they were asking the question, he is such a different person now if we were to execute him for this crime, it's like we're executing the wrong guy. And guess who came to the hearing? Relatives of the victim who Billy Moore had murdered. And they did something extraordinary. They begged for the board to spare the life of Billy Moore. They said, many years ago, Billy asked for our forgiveness, and we gave it to him. How could we not forgive him if God already had? And how can we not forgive Billy if God has already forgiven us? The Atlantic Journal newspaper ran an editorial and called Billy Moore a saintly figure. Mother Teresa called the parole board from India with a very simple message. She just said to them, do what Jesus would do. Well, Billy Moore knew one thing beyond a shadow of a doubt. He was guilty of horrible, heinous crime. He murdered a man in cold blood. He confessed to it. He admitted it. He was remorseful over it. And he knew under the laws of the state of Georgia, justice said he had to give his life in the electric chair. But the five members of the Georgia Pardon and Parole Board looked down at this repentant man, and they did something absolutely extraordinary. They said, in effect, we're going to show Billy Moore grace. And they threw out the death penalty, and they set the machinery in motion for Billy to be released from prison. The only time in American history I can find where a confessed and admitted murderer on death row is not just, you know, freed from the electric chair, but is released from prison. And you know what happened in the room when they announced that decision? <laughs> the whole room erupted with people singing the song, Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like Billy Moore. I mean, what else do you do at a moment like that but sing the anthem of forgiven people? 
I mean, friends, this is just a small taste of the radical grace of God. It's undeserved forgiveness. It's unmerited favor. It's outrageous compassion. It's incredible clemency. And can I tell you where Billy Moore is at this very moment? 33 years now after he was released from prison, he's where he is every Sunday morning. He's in church where he is an ordained minister in the town of Rome, Georgia, in a little church sandwiched between two public housing projects. And Billy Moore is a gentle man of compassion and prayer whose ministry is to serve those young people in that community who are forgotten by everybody else, troubled young people who need direction and hope. And everybody ignores them except Billy Moore, who ministers to them. And so through the years, Billy Moore and I have become good friends. He's my dear brother in Christ. In fact, I was just a few weeks ago out in Rome, Georgia, spent some more time with Billy. I took a picture of us. Uh, there we are. Uh, <laughs> that's Billy and I. And so we're buddies now, and, and, and a few years ago, I was at his house there in Rome, Georgia, and we were sipping iced tea, and I, and I said to him, I said, I was kind of playing with him, I said, Billy, it's just you and me here, right? There's no TV cameras, there's no reporters, there's no lawyers, there's no judges here. It's just the two of us. So you can talk completely candidly to me, completely honestly to me. He said, what do you mean? He said, Lee, or, or, or Billy, I'd like to know, what was it that changed your life? I said, it was the prison rehabilitation system that did it, right? And he laughed. He said, no, it wasn't that. I said, well, then, was it a self-help program? Was it developing a positive mental attitude? He said, no, it wasn't any of that. I said, was it Prozac? <laughs> was it transcendental meditation? was a psychological counseling. And he said, come on, Lee, you know it wasn't any of that. And I didn't know, but I wanted to hear him say it again. I said, no, Billy, you tell me. I want to hear it from your lips. What transformed Billy Moore? And he looked at me and said, Lee, plain and simple, it was Jesus Christ. He changed me in ways I never could have changed on my own. He gave me a reason to live. He helped me do the right thing. He gave me a heart for others, and he saved my soul. Think of those, aren't those four things we all long for. He gave me a reason to live. He helped me do the right thing. He gave me a heart for others, and he saved my soul. I mean, that, friends, is the power of God to transform a human being. And he offers to forgive you and to adopt you, and to swing open the doors of heaven for you. And he promises to imbue you with the person of the Holy Spirit in your life. And as you cooperate with him and grow through the years, to manifest these nine qualities of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It cost him everything. It cost him the death of his son on the cross to pay the penalty you deserve for the sins that you've committed so that he could offer forgiveness and eternal life as a free gift of his grace. So how do you receive that gift? Well, you know what? You, you basically do what Billy Moore did. Billy Moore went into court and pled guilty. And basically, that's what we need to do. We need to come to God and plead guilty. We got to confess, yes, I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong in my life. I knew they were wrong before I did them. I did them anyway. I've sinned. And I understand now that my sin has separated me from you because you're perfect, you're holy, you're pure, and I'm not. And so my wrongdoing has separated me from you. I don't want that. I want to be reconciled with you forever by receiving, by being forgiven of my sins. We want a relationship with God that begins that instant that we receive him and then continues the rest of our life as he will transform you and give you a reason to live. Well, I want to offer an opportunity for you to do that today. Not only that, 
but it's Super Baptism Weekend. And so this is an opportunity not only for you to receive this free gift of God's forgiveness and eternal life, but then today, right after the service, to publicly proclaim that through baptism right there in our fountain. We've got everything you need to do that. Change of clothes, air dryers, everything you need. No excuses. But you have the opportunity, a rare opportunity right now, to come to faith, to be baptized in public proclamation of that, and then for the rest of your life to have the joy of the Holy Spirit manifest these nine incredible qualities in your life. So if you want to take that step, I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. Just in your heart, pray this prayer. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And if you want to take that step, then just pray, Lord Jesus, right now, I confess to you the obvious, which is that I am a sinner. I know that. I've done things I knew they were wrong before I did them. I did them anyway. I confess that, and I want to turn from that. And in an attitude of repentance and faith, I want to receive. I want to receive your free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you purchased for me on the cross when you died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me so much. You endured the torture of the cross so that we could be reconciled forever. Help me, Jesus, to live the kind of life that you want me to live. Because from this moment on, I am yours. And now, Father, we know by your word that when anyone prays a prayer like that in sincerity and receives your free gift of forgiveness and eternal life, that they have walked from darkness to light, that they have been redeemed by you in that moment, that the Holy Spirit has taken up residency in them, and that over time, he will change their values and character and morality and attitudes and relationships all for your glory. Thank you for this incredible transaction that you offer. Thank you for this great church that proclaims your message of hope and grace far and wide. Thank you for the 548 folks who are going to proclaim publicly this weekend that they are your child forever. We thank you for all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our forgiver and who is our leader and who is our very best friend. And all God's people said, amen.